Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and I'm back uh, playing Kerbal Space Program again. Because, uh, well, there's a, a fascinating news story that broke in the last week. So, yeah, obviously Kerbal Space Program is this video game which really has turned into quite a detailed simulator, and it lets people like me pretend to be astronauts and solve problems in space. And then... There's Jared Isaacman, who, is, being a billionaire, decided to spend a lot of money and go to space and learn how to do EVAs. And this week, or well, last Thursday, there was a, an announcement from NASA. And it got really fascinating when we saw that the list of people on the call making the announcement included the person in charge of the Hubble Space Telescope and Jared Isaacman. And we wondered... What do those things have in common? Well, of course, Jared is behind Polaris Dawn, which wants to do the first civilian EVA, and the Hubble Space Telescope is a structure which has been serviced in space by astronauts on EVA. And yes, it turns out that SpaceX is volunteering to do its own internal study, an unfunded Space Act agreement, wherein they want to investigate things they can do to perhaps restore or improve the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, specifically, they talked about boosting the Hubble Space Telescope into a higher orbit so that it will remain in orbit longer, because without this, there's a 50% chance that by the end of the 2030s, the Hubble will have deorbited. The Hubble Space Telescope was launched in 1990 via Space Shuttle, and the fact that they had the Space Shuttle is the reason why Hubble was successful, because of course it had problems with its mirrors, and in subsequent servicing missions they were able to work around these problems and fix the spacecraft. The final servicing mission was STS-125, and by the time that was going to happen, we knew the space shuttle was going to be retired, and they basically replaced everything they thought might actually break. Uh, but with the understanding that the space shuttle wouldn't ever be able to return, and therefore the space telescope may not be able to get serviced. And with this in mind, they added the soft capture and rendezvous system, which is more or less a docking adapter, which is now the NASA docking system. And this is what SpaceX, you know, Dragon has, has equipped on it. However, it's not the same thing, actually. This is sort of like a beta version. There's a number of differences, like the petal geometry is very similar. The dimensions are the same. And I think it's different enough that while Dragon could align with it, it couldn't latch onto it without modifications. But that's not the other, that, not the only problem, because of course Dragon has its docking adapter underneath this big nose cone, and that would actually get in the way. So you can't just fly a SpaceX Dragon up to the back of Hubble and you know hook in and then give it a boost, and that would actually not be the most efficient way of doing things. Those four holes around that hatch, those are the main engines that they use for on-orbit maneuvers because those are the engines which are aligned with the axis of the spacecraft. So they don't have any angular losses due to firing off-center. So when Dragon does most of its big orbital maneuvers, it does so by rever basically reversing. And that means it would make most sense to actually put the docking system inside the trunk and then have it extend out to connect with the Hubble. For the crew missions to the International Space Station, they haven't used the trunk for anything. They have used it on Cargo Dragon. Specifically, they carried up like the uh, rollout solar arrays and the airlock, the Bishop airlock, which Nanorax uses. So that would be the most logical place to put specialist docking hardware. Now this couldn't just be a passive piece of hardware which was sitting in there. It would have to be able to actively move. The upper stage actually extends up inside the trunk by about 1.2 meters, 4 feet. So the docking adapter would have to move out at least about a meter and a half so it could actually interface with the back or with the adapter on the uh, telescope. But if you could do that, it would definitely see a, a reboost of Hubble Space Telescope being a very simple operation. But in an interview today, Jared said that they would like to leave the telescope in better condition than they found it. And Hubble, while it is a world-class instrument that is still doing amazing cutting-edge research and complementing the James Webb Space Telescope, it has not been rendered redundant by the James Webb. 
the the thing is the Hubble is getting old and and while they replaced all the aging components the last time they were at it, things have broken since then. And they're basically down to, I think, one working computer now. Uh, they've got only three of the six gyroscopes working. If they have another gyroscope failure, then they will have some serious trouble actually doing any science. Now, the gyroscopes are actually relatively small. They come in pairs in what are called rate sensor units, RSUs. So there's three of these on Hubble. And yeah, you know, you can install these relatively easily if you can get access. The problem is, of course, access to Hubble was pretty much predicated on having, uh, you know, this, the manipulator arm that could put the astronauts in the right place. And of course, astronauts having EVA suits that are designed for this kind of work. The concept art for Polaris Dawn doesn't imply suits with that level of capability. But, you know, maybe SpaceX is going there. I'm pretty sure that they can't use existing EMU suits or hypothetical XEMU suits because they wouldn't fit through that front hatch. They might fit through the side hatch, but again, the concept are always shows people using the front hatch. They would require all sorts of, you know, railings and support to be able to get down to the back to actually do any work. And of course, NASA would be pretty sure that they would want an experienced astronaut on this, someone that actually knew Hubble. And I think the best option here would be Drew Feustel, who was on uh, STS-125 and did three spacewalks, and he is still an active astronaut. A more likely upgrade proposal would be just to have a module which connects to the back and it contains the gyros, it contains a computer, its own power, and it somehow takes over a lot of the pointing and attitude problem, you know, capabilities of the rest of the telescope and then leaves the instruments on the telescope to do, you know, to handle all that stuff. Uh, now, that does still leave them vulnerable to, you know, if there's another computer failure. They apparently have come up with ways of operating it with a greatly reduced computer capability. I think they, where they, I think they call it blind mode, but I'm not really sure exactly what's involved. But it basically lets them take observations without all the, um, without the main computer actually being as you know, directly involved as you expect. So, you know, this would be very similar to the mission extension vehicles we've seen, which go up to satellites in geostationary orbit and replace their pointing capabilities with new hardware. I'm sure you could use these actually as a basis for the design of such a thing, uh, so it wouldn't be so bespoke in terms of its design. Having said that, it would still have to be small enough to fit inside the, you know, inside the trunk section of a Dragon. And one thing I'm not sure on is how high you could theoretically boost Hubble if you were just using the Dragon capsule. So the Inspiration4 mission, that went to an altitude of about 585 kilometers. That's the highest they've flown a Dragon spacecraft. When Hubble was launched, it was launched to an altitude of 620 kilometers. That was the highest space shuttle missions that were ever flown. Now, a lot of that comes down to can you, you know, I'm basically optimizing the launch trajectory to use as much of the fuel from the second stage getting it into this orbit so that you're not having to use the propellant on board the Dragon because you would want to use that for the rendezvous, for the docking, and then for the boosting. The Dragon carries something like you know, over a ton of propellant on it, which is actually enough to boost Hubble up, if you include the mass of the Dragon capsule, you know, back to like a 600 kilometer orbit and still have enough fuel to get the Dragon capsule back down into the atmosphere. But it all depends on how high you can inject the spacecraft initially. I'm sure SpaceX could come up with a way to put extra repellent inside the trunk and hey, that might be an option for future missions. Uh, but but equally, you know, it's kind of hard for them to route that around because they would have to change the umbilical system and things like that. You know, there's the heat shield is in the way and you don't want to have pipes going through your heat shield, do you? But perhaps one of the most fascinating parts of this is simply the fact that you've got a private individual who loves space, uh, who clearly loves the Hubble Space Telescope, that essentially wants to spend a bunch of his own money to go up and help service it, help make sure that it doesn't fall by the wayside. It's like, you know, those concerned members of the community who spend their own money solving local problems. 
And you know, I totally understand that. If I had a ridiculous amount of money, uh, I would love to spend a lot of, you know, going up to the International Space Station and doing space archaeology, finding all those things that have been lost. I'd love to find like the iPods that have been lost on the space station and figure out who was listening to what. I completely understand that working on an EVA to fix hardware in space is incredibly hard work, but it's hard work that, boy, I would love to have a go at. Oh yeah, my Kerbal model didn't quite work the way I anticipated. The module I bolted onto the back uh, had some collision issues and I shattered the solar panels. But hey, one of the solar panels survived, so that's good enough for me. I imagine if this thing happened in real life, NASA would be a whole lot less happy. And that's why it's just a study rather than a firm plan of action at this time. Because you don't want some billionaire crashing into the Hubble Space Telescope and ruining everyone's day. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.